All right, welcome everyone to the September 9th iteration of the Qvert SIG storage call. Um, let's go ahead and jump right in. I see we have at least one agenda item from Alex. So if you're ready, Alex, go ahead. I can start, but maybe uh, Barack wants to start. Hey. Uh, yeah, so... Uh... I noticed that uh, I saw that there are some issues uh, with CDI regarding the uh, quota, and there is some situation where there is double counting for PVCs, and I just wanted to ask uh, if there are any plans on how to solve it or uh, uh, anything at all, actually. Um, has uh, there been an issue reported yet? No, I just I noticed that uh, Michael uh, uh, is working on some some uh, Jira issue uh, regarding uh, AQ, and, and we already have a, a similar solution for uh, for memory request and uh, and CPU request double counting. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, that's it basically. <clears throat> yeah, so for people that aren't familiar, uh, maybe Brock uh, can give a better description than, than I can, but there's um, <clears throat> a Qbert for spe specific controller uh, for monitoring uh, quota, and it does some neat things for VMs like uh, avoid double counting if you're doing a live migration, which is like kind of necessary for um, things like when you upgrade Qvert and it, you know, upgrades um, for launchers and a lot of migrations may happen. And there are some other things there that, you know, are kind of nice to have for Qvert. Um, so one uh, feature that I think was thought up one feature of this was, well, uh, should AAQ hide the CDI worker pods? And um, I spent a lot of time um, thinking about how we could do that, and it's pretty pretty straightforward. But what, uh, so we could do that. Um, but what kind of occurred to me was that CDI uses a bunch of, creates some temporary PVCs. So like if you're doing say an import that uses scratch space with the populator, <clears throat> the Kubernetes quota will actually count that as three PVCs. There's the target PVC, which will be, you know, uh, unbound until the operation is complete. Um, the what we call the prime PVC, which is the one where we actually um, will eventually be the target when we rebind it and the scratch PVC. So I figured if we're gonna go through all this effort to hide pods, you know, it, it, it well, my thinking was it seems a little weird to go through the effort to hide CDI pods uh, if these PVCs are still exposed. Um, and I think that makes sense on a uh, logical level, you know, it, 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 I think that for completeness, you'd want to kind of hide all this stuff. Um, but it gets a little tricky when you get into the details of how to do that. Um, and, you know, Barack knows more about this, but basically um, the way the AAQ works now, it, uh, relies on some scheduler hooks to um, do its work. Whereas with PVCs, you know, PVCs don't really get scheduled. So we'd have to do something with uh, admission. And that is, you know, a huge chunk of work, I think, um, for AAQ. I think it's like possible and there are definitely a lot of, it, it's just a big lot of work that needs to, I think, be properly um, planned out and and uh, designed and 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 feature and uh, you know implemented. So it just it's just it's just it doesn't really fit 
basically supporting PVCs doesn't fit neatly into the existing paradigm of AAQ. Is that, would you say that's true, Brack? Uh, yeah, exactly. Actually, uh, supporting PVC sounds like a great idea, but uh, um, like you mentioned, uh, AQ currently uses uh, scheduling aids uh, to uh, prevent ports from getting scheduled uh, if there isn't enough quota. And uh, and as you mentioned, the uh, PVCs are not are not scheduled. But uh, I also spoke with Alex earlier and uh, about some alternative stuff we can do to prevent uh, uh, prevent uh, I don't know um, activating PVCs. Um, um, and I understood that uh, maybe in CDI there is a way to like prevent the bounding of PVCs or, or something like that. And and we could count the PVC only after the a, a label is being added to to the PVCs that the AQ adds uh, if there's enough quota or something similar to simulate the scheduling gates uh, uh, in some way. I don't know I don't know, but uh, maybe we can think of something uh, to make it work. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, we, we've put it easier because we already have this, uh, let's call it activation field, uh, which is scheduling gate uh, with pods, but uh, with PVCs, uh, we don't have it. And and actually, the problem is that, uh, that uh, in Kubernetes, they have the privilege to control the, the admission. Uh, because because they own it, so so they can assume some assumptions that we can. This is why we cannot add this logic into the admission. I mean, uh, during the admission, there could be multiple uh, requests that are being processed in the same time, and uh, and, uh, and um, during the verification, uh, the admission controller. Uh, is isn't is not aware of all the requests that are being uh, processed altogether, and uh, this is a problem. So uh, okay. Kubernetes um, has a, a way of handling this, and, and in addition to this, uh, even if we let's say approve PVC deletion and uh, uh, re and remove the counting from the quota, uh, even if uh, if the deletion uh, pass our uh, validation, it doesn't mean that it, that, that uh, the deletion of PVC would pass other uh, other validation or mutations of of the admission. So we can't really rely on this. And uh, with uh, Kubernetes admission controller, the quota validation is the last uh, is the last validation. This is why why they can do it. Yeah. Are you referring to like storage class quotas? Cause that's something that I don't know that a lot of us um, play around with, but like, I think that's gonna be, if someone has a very strict storage class quota uh, on a namespace that we could run into that with the temporary PVCs. Is that what you're talking about? Well, so quota can be, it, it can be, just for the entire namespace or for a storage class in a namespace. It's just a different, mm -hmm. so you can specify it either way. Um, and it works the same, I assume. But yeah, I think, yeah, there are definitely uh, synchronization and I think locking things. I mean, how do you, <laughs> you'd have to somehow, uh, I, I, I don't, yeah, it, it, it seems like a complicated problem that we'd have to think out, think out. I think, um, <clears throat> one thing that we have, you know, maybe we can't, uh, you know, it, again, I think this is a huge project for someone to, to research, but I, I think that, yeah, there are definitely, if you want to support just on raw PVC level, um, yeah, there's some thorny synchronization issues there. I, I could believe that, um, one thing we could consider is uh, since we have this data volume API, which creates the PVCs uh, that we could maybe do something on that level 
you know, um, I'm not exactly sure how that would work, but I think that would give us some uh, potential freedom there where we could, um, since, since, you know, the data volume controller creates the PVCs, um, you know, th th there, there could be something there we could do since there's a little level of abstraction there. And, and, but it's still, um, and then, yeah, so if, if and then the, the way AAQ would work would see if, you know, if the PVCs are owned, um, you know, by the, by data volume, just do like the traditional thing. Otherwise, uh, yeah. I, again, I don't know exactly how it works, but I think that we may be able to do something on PVCs that are um, owned by data volumes. So that mm -hmm. is potentially, I think, one. <clears throat> If if doing it on raw PVC level becomes too thorny with these synchronization issues, <clears throat> does it does it help if like we would create the uh, PVC prime and scratch in a dedicated namespace where we could have a basically mm -hmm. system wide quota that's not tied to the specific uh, virtual machine, and then when we uh, namespace transfer into the actual target PVC. That's the only one that really is associated with the app itself. Yeah, I mean, this was something I remember we talked about in the early days of populators. Do we want to mm -hmm. do everything in a uh, dedicated namespace? And right. we decided not to um, yep. for reasons. <laughs> like, for, well, for security or privacy reasons, because then uh, that namespace becomes... Um, privileged essentially but yeah um definitely uh that that would be uh doing everything in a dedicated namespace would um yeah certainly um potentially hide some of these make it easier to hide some of these quota issues Okay. Um, I want, I have to ask, um, which may be obvious to you, but like, what are the implications of not handling the, uh, the PVC aspect of this? Yeah. So this is, this is the question. I mean, I think, uh, we had a ticket to hide. I, I think the, so, the, right. So there are a couple, uh, we should talk about the path forward. We have a ticket to hide, um, the CDI pods. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and given the lack of coverage for uh, PVCs at the moment, you know, does it still make sense to hide the CDI pods or should we wait until uh, we have a solution for um, PVCs as well? You know, that that's the question, I think, you know, does it, would it be weird if, we hide the pods, but there are still these, you know, temporary like PVCs. I, I don't know. So the, does the PVC uh, pod uh, is bound to a VMI? How does it work? When when is it being created? Uh, so um, no. It, so basically, uh, well. Uh, the scratch and prime PVCs are not uh, at all ever directly referenced by a VMI. Yeah, but the pods, the pods themselves. Uh... The, what, do you, what do you mean? So, do we have a pod uh, for each VMI? Do we have the CDI pod? Uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with the. So the, what? So what would? So basically, the way it works is: say you have a VM with a data volume template. Um, the way it works now is, you know, uh, if you have when you create a VM that has like a data volume template that has um, a PVC, like a, a data volume that imports from a, a URL, uh, a pod is created. Uh, to um, basically download that disk image and write it to a PVC. And it uses some number of, and you may use a scratch PVC as well. Mm. 
Okay, I understand. So it's it's like uh and then and that's in the case like so and there's there's really no relation between CDI pods and VMIs. Like if you create a, a VM, like a VM that it, yeah, there's really no relation between CDI pods and VMIs. Um when you create a VM that has data volume templates, that may cause some CDI work to happen. Um, if, but if it's a wait for first consumer case, uh, the pods actually won't be created until the VM is started. Anyway, I, I, it, it's um, there's no direct link, really. It, it's uh, only for really wait for first consumer case may there be a CDI pod when a VM VMI exists. Mm, I understand. Oh, so we want to hide this uh, this pod uh, whenever uh, we use like virtual resources as a configuration in AQ. Uh, well, that makes sense. Yeah, it, it's just very disconnected. I do think that like if we zoom out though, a um a cluster user is consuming resources by their creation of data volumes. So like imagine just some annoying user that just created a thousand data volumes that um imported a ton of data, maybe even sequentially to this to a single PVC. You are creating work on the cluster. So one could easily argue that that work you're creating should count against uh, your research usage of that cluster. So, I mean, in, in some point, I argue that that's sort of like, you probably have enough resources. If you have enough to run the VM, you probably have enough resources to perform the, uh, the provisioning step prior to running the VM. Uh, but it should, and it should be fewer resources than the VM. So it should always work, but um, there is resource consumption. Like imagine somebody just creating a bunch of data volumes without ever intending to run a virtual machine just to create work for the cluster. So I think, I think there should be in that regard, there should be accounting for the work. Um, it's just that in the normal case, it should never be more resources to provision than the VM already gets. Yeah, I understand. The thing is, uh, when we created the, this AQ, the project, um, uh, we had some requests to count uh, resources by, uh, to count the virtual resources of VM, like the RAM size and the virtual CPUs, because uh, in some cloud providers uh, uh, charge uh, users by the virtual resources. Mm -hmm. So, so it makes sense to hide the uh, the overhead. So I'm I'm not really sure um, if uh, this, if CDI pods are it should be considered as, as overhead. Like, sure, yeah. It's from whose perspective, basically. Uh, you're looking at the resource usage, right? So, yeah, that makes sense. So if we do nothing, I guess, then help me understand, I guess, then the user is getting, uh, yeah, well, maybe you can walk me through that. Like, what does doing nothing actually? Uh, yeah, so um, basically, uh... Uh, currently, uh, if you define, uh, we have uh, we we can set uh, in AQ uh, we have alternative uh, alternative CR, CR for uh, the quota. So uh, if you set uh, 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 let's say memory uh, request, uh, it set boundaries for memory request uh, for VMI. Uh, so set uh, memory request boundaries, then whenever you create a VMI, uh, we have some configuration that uh, makes the quota count the, 
the resource, the memory request as the RAM size, but uh, let's say you have like a, a giga, a v, VMI that uh, with a gigabyte of RAM. So in, in, if uh, it ha it needs data volume, uh, so this the VMI creation uh, would count would cause the quota to count both the the VMI round size and the CDI uh, memory request uh, will yeah. be counted as well because we currently uh, we don't consider it so uh, this is what I think uh, they meant when they uh, when when QE created this uh, Jira issue. I, I think what may be more, I think the, you know, we don't request a lot of resources for the CI. I think what could be more impactful is the, like, if you have a, a limit on the number of pods, so say you just install an upgrade and a lot of migrations are going on and then you like uh, import a bunch of, create a bunch of new VMs that are doing a bunch of imports. I think the, the pod numbers may be more. Uh, impactful. I don't know. What do you think, Barack? Uh, yeah, but uh, I mean, doing upgrades. Uh, I'm not doing upgrade upgrades. We uh, there are there could be many migrations, right? Uh, multiple migrations at the same time. Uh, I'm not sure if this would cause a CDI pods. Uh, to be created as well. And no, I'm wondering. Now, no, like just if you if if somehow you, <laughs> I just I'm I'm, I, I'm thinking that the the pod li the limits and the numbers of pods maybe have more of an effect than the limits on the memory. But could be it could be. Uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, um, there could be. We have. In AQ, uh, we have uh, we have a way to uh, to add a sidecar container to the controller, so so user could count uh, VMs however they like. So if they want to, like let's say ignore the pods count, they could, uh, or just for VM for virt launchers, for example, and they could could ignore. Uh, CDI pod counts as well. Uh, if 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 this is uh, what you implemented in the sidecar container, um, yeah. but I mean, part of me thinks that you know the purpose of the quota is to keep uh, resource usage uh, under a certain uh, amount. So if we are doing a cluster upgrade, it seems reasonable to basically. If there's also provisioning happening at the same time, we may not want to do both of those. We may actually want the upgrades to uh, complete before creating new VMs, for example, in order to keep the resource usage of that namespace uh, within a certain threshold. So actually counting the the pods because they do represent actual work that the cluster is do doing might be appropriate. Yes, yeah, so uh, actually you are right. Uh, might some users might want uh, to count this, but uh, some uh, might want to avoid it. Uh, the, um, there is also the also um, some of the uh, resources request uh, are implementation detail. I mean, a VMI uh, would request uh, additional. I don't know, 500 megabytes today. And next version, this could become 700 uh, megabytes. Uh, mm -hmm. And we don't want to couple the users to the to the VMI implementation. They, sure. they, they shouldn't know about, it. I mean, some of them. So, so my, my want to, to count the, the overhead as well. This is why we have the the sidecar container uh, option mm -hmm. for 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 uh, users that would like to choose. However, uh, 
the the resources should be counted uh, for for their workloads. So is it is it fair to say that if you wanted to count all raw Kubernetes resource usage, then you could continue to use the standard uh, Kubernetes quota mechanisms. But if you want to only count logical resources, aka virtual machine uh, resources in the specific memory that the workload itself is asking for, then you'd use AAQ. Yeah. So. Uh... Currently, we have like three con built-in configurations in AQ. We have one for virtual resources, which count just the virtual resources for uh, virtual machines. Uh, and uh, of course, it, it would ignore uh, the migration overhead. Uh, mm -hmm. So there is a double counting during migration. Yep. And, and you, you have another configuration to separate the virtual machine, the virtual resources from the uh, standard uh, pods re resources. So you have like a, a request memory and you have a request memory VMI. Uh, that's, uh, that's another resource for, for, uh, for the RAM size of virtual machines in the namespace. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so this, this is, this configuration exists if some users want this separation and it, it is useful if they have both VMs and pods uh, mm -hmm. on the same namespace. And you also have uh, uh, another configuration to count uh, resources just like how Kubernetes does and, and but uh, ignore the migration overhead. So just for migrations, uh, we would ignore the additional resources. So uh, upgrades won't be blocked. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask a, a, a question then, uh, like where, if, even for the benefits of this, no, of these notes, where is all of this information documented so that folks who wanted to go back and get, because me, I'm, I'm kind of almost using this as a, as a learning session about AAQ, because it's not something that I'm, I know Michael's been looking into it. Do we have docs for this? So just like, a few minutes ago, we we merged the documentation PR uh, upstream documentations. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, and it, it I will I will send you the link. So could you actually? I'm gonna tag you in the notes, and if you could actually, uh, just link to that uh, doc, that would be really handy. I think for everyone's. Right. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to tag you. That would be helpful, I think, for people following along. Um, yeah, I think it seems to me that with those different configurations, then we kind of know what the the right thing is. Like right now you know, in the, if you're only counting virtual resources, then you should ignore all the CDI stuff. If you're counting Kubernetes resources at yeah, low so, level, then we should include them. Yeah, exactly. So I think that uh, uh, the the Jira issues that we are refer referring to are, are about the built-in configuration we have for virtual machines. Uh, to make something to count the resources, CDI pods or whatever in a way that makes sense for for the specific configuration. Uh, and maybe we, we should add more configurations. I don't know. We, we should probably discuss it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe there's not a, I'm just not sure that we'll actually, whoops, did this, oh, it actually did fix that. And it was an indirect link. Um, yeah, maybe we should, like, I'm trying to figure out, I don't know that we're gonna get to a path forward on this call. So what would be the next steps? Uh, I think that we should focus on, on the pods right now because uh, that, that shouldn't be too hard. Uh, PVC uh, is much complex, much more complex than that. 
Uh, what do Michael? What do you think? What do others think? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not too sure that it makes it. I mean, yeah, it, it's. I think it's pretty easy to add support for the CDI pods. I just think it's. Um, I don't know. To me, it just feels weird to do it without without the P, without the PVC support. But I don't know. Um, maybe we can feature date it or something. I don't know. The, the PVC support uh, could be useful, definitely. Uh, but uh, but it will probably take much more time. Uh, to support this. Uh, okay. So what's the scheduling readiness I think you mentioned? Like how does that work on pods and uh, could it be also implemented for PVCs? Yeah, so so actually, it's it's much simpler than it sounds. Um, if you are familiar with some finalizers, um, so whenever you delete a pod, the pod won't be deleted until all the finalizers are removed, right? Right. So in the same way, uh, whenever you create a pod with scheduling gates, the pod won't be scheduled until all the scheduling gates are removed from the pod. So, uh, so this is it basically, and only mutating webhook would add a uh, scheduling gates to a pod. So, uh, so the how it works is that uh, during pod creation, uh, AQ adds uh, uh, scheduling gates to pods uh, during admission, and once it uh, well, if there is enough water, uh, the controller then will remove the scheduling gates from the pod uh, and count the will count the resources uh, in all the relevant water in this namespace. So. Okay. And would it make even sense to have this on PVCs, like? Yes, yeah, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think that the problem is that we would have to find another way um, to prevent like uh, PVCs from being bound or uh, so we could do something similar to the scheduling gates and, and wait for AQ to, to uh, count to count to uh, validate that there is enough water for the PVCs, and 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 maybe notify CDI to label or annotation that there is enough water, so it could proceed. But I'm not sure uh, if this is possible or uh, I'm not really familiar with. Uh, I meant like implementing. Uh... Like Kubernetes implementing uh, scheduling gates for PVCs and taking a data. Yeah, so PVCs are not being scheduled, so you don't need to schedule. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe you could have like a, I don't know what's the equivalent word, but something like scheduling gates for PVCs. No, I think what we I think I mean the easiest thing that just occurred to me it, it so if we go the just doing data volume like where we just support data volumes um and not what PVC level um we would have to I think what we could do is uh have to have basically some synchronization with AAQ like maybe AAQ could add an annotation to a data volume that says like don't don't do anything with this yet, and then the CDI controller will see that will see that annotation and just wait for something else for AAQ to say like coast is clear or something like that. But again, it's very racy. I, I'm not sure that will work either. But that yeah, 
is is a similar mechanism to uh, that scheduling gate thing, but I don't. I, I still think it, it, it. There are races there too. Well, if we had a mutating webhook that uh, placed a like a hold, uh, like a hold AAQ annotation uh, upon the object creation, and then AAQ could actually clear that annotation, maybe that would be better. No, that was what I was thinking, yeah. but I think it's still potentially, uh, I'm not sure that, um, I don't know how, how that could be done in a totally, um, race free way. I don't know. So, and also, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Bro. Again, I think the PVC support is, is a huge research topic. Oh, sorry. Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah uh, so for codes, uh, we have the race. Uh, we do have uh, some 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 log for for this race. Uh, like uh, there is there is the stage where you need to verify that there is enough room for a pod, and uh, and once you verify that there is enough room for the pod, you need to update the quota and only then remove the scheduling gate uh, from the pod. But during this time, you need to make sure that uh, that other pods uh, won't be uh, evaluated as well. So for this, we have another CRD CRD for, for the locking. Like we mentioned, we we, we have this list of pod, uh, pods that uh, we need to release. Uh, and only once we update, uh, we, re we release all the pods, only then we would update the quota, and then we would start all, all over again. So this is how we deal with the race situation with quotes. So maybe you could look, look it up, do something similar. Okay, so yeah, I mean, that for me is like a um probably like a jira epic for uh including pvcs in aaq um i mean just thinking like in terms of path forward so um but i guess the question is like michael would you would you knack progress on the pods aspect or can that proceed uh i, I don't know i think um uh, to me, I think, I mean, we can add the, it seems it's not complicated to add the support. I think I, I just, I'm not sure we want to, you know, enable it by default with the rest of the stuff, maybe a feature. So, okay. So how about the plan being, we have a feature gate for storage AAQ integration. And if you turn that on, then you can get the, the pod bypass behavior. And eventually the PVC behavior would be added under that feature gate. And then if we decide we like how all that stuff comes together, then we can, you know, do the feature gate life cycle for that feature so that at some point it's uh, it's always there. Yeah, I think that that's fine. I think, uh, yeah. Okay, so I think, uh, so here's the, here's the, I'm going to write that down. So uh, introduce a uh, storage AAQ feature gate. Um, and then implement. Sense, I, I didn't hear, excuse me. So I'm typing it in here. So we'll introduce a storage AAQ feature gate and we'll implement CDI pod handling first. Uh, this is off by default to start with. Um, implement CDI pod handling first. Uh, later, we can add, also add PVC slash DV handling. Um, and then uh, this feature gate uh, would be handled according to the standard divert. Oops. Uh, 
life cycle. Okay, so basically we'll put it under a feature gate. We can add the pod stuff. People won't see that unless they turn on the, the feature gate. Then over time, because I, I don't know when we'd be able to complete the research and implement the PVC uh, DV handling aspects, but that could be added underneath that feature gate as well. So those people who are like exploring this uh, can evaluate that feature over time if we like it. Uh, the feature gate can be turned on by default and then scheduled for removal. So that's a way to kind of give us a little bit of a playground to uh, to work with this over time. One of the reasons I was asking about what happens is if we do nothing is do we wind up with an AQ environment that's fundamentally broken with this unhandled or is it good enough as we continue to enhance it with storage capability? I guess I think it's fine and totally useful as is. Um, okay. Barack, do you agree? Yeah, I agree. I just I'm not sure that you would yeah. need a feature gate for the pod handling because this is just for counting in the uh, resource quota alternative CR. Uh, it wouldn't affect anything else. So. Uh, I'm not sure that the feature gate is, but maybe for the PVCs, because in the PVC, you might need to change some stuff in, in CDI. Mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, regarding the pod, I don't think that you you even need anything in, in CDI. So, so I- No, I, no so, you don't need anything in CDI. The feature gate would be for AAQ. Ah, for AAQ. Uh, currently, mm, and, uh, uh, yeah, so this project is relatively new, and we, we don't have feature gates. We no, not yet, but uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. Well, the discussions we just don't not sure that you know until we figure out the PVC data volume story. Maybe it, it makes sense to have people explicitly opt in if they want this behavior rather than. Yeah. yeah, quotas is a, I mean, this kind of stuff is a really touchy thing and it's possible we're going to get it uh, wrong a couple times before we get it right. So that's why I do think that having a feature gate for adding this kind of stuff is important so that we can uh, carefully build it out without breaking what's already there. Yeah, I understand. Uh, but, but for the pods, uh, I think that most of the, of the logic is already there. Uh, yeah, so we just need like specific uh, handling for for this uh, for this kind of pods. Okay. Yeah, but for PVC, definitely we 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 might we want this uh, we want this be done to a feature gate. All right. So I want to. I guess that's going to be the the topic uh, to to carry forward is whether to put the pod part under the feature gate or not. Um, I think that there are two um, opposing viewpoints here that are are good. So I I would propose that discussion continues um, away from the call. I think we've made some good progress here, but I want to make sure that I make a bit of space for Alex's item next. So is it okay if we move on to the second agenda item? Yes. But okay. Mean. All right. Thanks for bringing that discussion. I think it was an important one and good use of this time together. So uh, let's move on to Alex. Right. So uh, I'll try to do it quicker since we're already over time. So uh, it's not like the Qbert six storage lanes are in a really bad state, but uh, there's this new metric that counts uh, how many retests one had to issue against a good hash. So if your PR later mer merged with the same hash, then you call it a good one, like a good hash, since it eventually passed and merged. And uh, uh, judging by that metric, we're not doing great. And uh, I've asked Brian from the CI to send me like a list of of jobs behind that metric so I could look where 
where we fail most? Like if there's maybe like a really common failure or is it scattered around? So he did send me those. And uh, what I found is that we're mostly hurting, hurting in random tests due to like uh, etcd issues so every once in a while a different test fails with some etcd related timeout and uh we kind of we kind of uh we knew about this uh we knew that this is a problem with uh with the storage lane since all other lanes do etcd in memory so we use the actual ci cluster storage whereas others are mostly uh, like SIG compute, SIG network, they use the memory, they use like half a gig for etcd. And that works fine. That that's it proved it proved itself in the past and uh, it's not clean and it's not really resembling a real setup, but it, it works better than using the storage. Um so we don't really we didn't really like this idea so we reverted from using it in the past, but we do need an alternative if we want our lane to be green. So uh, I last week we had a thread where uh, everyone was participating um, and we did find a new approach where you would still use storage, like persistent storage for LCD, so you wouldn't be using the RAM but you would be uh, disabling, well, you, you would be getting rid of the storage flushes. So you wouldn't be flushing the log describing the commit or the data after each write. Instead, you would be relying on the OS to do it whenever, whenever it wants to. It's, it's considered like an unsafe configurable on its CD, but it's there and it seems to work for other big projects like cert manager um like certificate management obviously um and they have been doing that for years now and it seems to work really well for them so that's my proposal for uh stabilizing the kubert 6 storage lanes and uh i only the, the only thing i need is like thoughts uh, go no go um what do you think? Maybe maybe we want to do like uh, in memory again, just to relieve the lanes. It's we just need to do something to make it better. Do we have a way of evaluating? Like, do we have a way of knowing when a failure appears to be related to an etcd failure? Because it'd be great to see if we could measure this. You know, like let's put it this on, and if we see that problem alleviated, then we know it was a good choice. Yeah, so uh, usually the way I noticed it is just you get clear errors back from the API server that say you timed out, it's a D timeout or something like that. Okay. But uh, yeah, getting those metrics out of the cluster, that's not something that's implemented today. Okay. Like getting like a 99th percentile metrics, I think that's like a the the good gauge for etcd uh state i don't think mm -hmm. we expose that okay i wonder if it's something we could do um i don't know how much work that is yeah i think it's doable like the metrics should be there maybe you have to enable a couple of extra components mm -hmm. but it's doable um yeah but but for like uh, short short time range, I think we just need to know if uh, if this suggested approach is good, or maybe we even want to just do etcd in memory for a while just to relieve the failures. Why is failure uh, why is adopting what the other lanes um, have done a bad idea for us? Because if we we already have a demonstrated track record of success in the other lanes by using the in memory option, what makes it bad for storage particularly? I, didn't we weren't we using it in memory for a while and then we that had, yeah, yeah. It, I think the issue is you know the 
the Kubert CI with Rook Ceph, you know, uses, I think, just a lot more memory than the other lanes don't have like Ceph, and that's a big deployment in the cluster that I think uses a lot of memory. Can we just add more memory to our lanes so that we have room to do both? I don't know. I think we can, like, uh, I don't think it's even capped today. Like, I checked it out, and it seems like we only specified the request for the CI worker. So it seems that memory is, I don't know, is uh, the issue that we're running into is storage related, uh, like IO related. So um, if we alleviate that at the cost of needing a little bit more memory, hopefully we could pull that memory without uh, creating another an, a memory problem instead of an IO problem. But it might be interesting to try etcd in memory with a corresponding increase in the memory request for the job, I guess, basically. Well, I think you also have to increase requests for the etcd, like, you know, deployment or whatever it uses, right? Yeah. Whatever this etcd pod configuration is. Because mm. I, I would prefer, in my mind, I would prefer that we're not different from the other lanes in this regard if we don't have to be. Now, if we have to be, that's a good reason, but like to have everyone doing it the same way uh, makes our success and failure rate a little bit more comparable in a way. Like in my mind, it just feels cleaner to use the workaround that everyone else used. And if that means we need to add more memory, that seems cleaner than just trying a different knob to see if that helps. But. Yeah, I think it's just, yeah, I mean, uh, the, yeah, I mean, we have the Rook stuff, which uses more memory, but we also, uh, you know, just, I think, um, create more research, like our, our tests to just use that CD more than the other ones. We have, you know, these other PVC resources, which, like we said earlier, there's three, you know, PVCs created for every import or whatever. Like, I, I think we just stress etcd more in our case. And we're still using the API server to track status of the import, right? So that could be another related thing if we're adjusting the the DV progress to be less uh, uh, less granular. It could ease the burden on etcd. To, if we, I don't know if we think that that's enough of an issue here, but. I know that there was some issues that were, we felt like we were hammering the resources more, uh, like yeah, abusing FCD for status, basically. Yeah, I think uh, the the progress may actually explain like a lot of the of the pressure. So that's something um, to consider uh, addressing on the back end too. Is like let's fix the progress. I thought we had some open uh, tasks on that. Yeah, I think I saw I saw those. Uh, regarding your question about um, diverging away from others, I think, yeah, for now, I, I really want to stay close to the other lanes, maybe even re-enable the in-memory etcd. But ultimately, I think we're all in the wrong using that. Like, it makes no sense to sacrifice uh, like half a gig of memory, of good memory that you could have used for an extra two VMs in parallel testing for etcd. So uh, yeah, yeah. And it's pretty chaotic in general. Like, you know, my my approach is also not very production ready, but like um, at least there you would be saving that uh, half a gig memory. Mm -hmm. All right. So um i don't know what the con do we ha are we able to get to a consensus um i mean i think alex's pr is worth a shot okay i mean it's it's nice and easy to try something and and see how it see how it does over time so i think it's the risk is pretty low and i'd say like what do you think, like short term enabling, uh, like just to alleviate the pressure on the lane on, on the merge queue, um, just using the CDN memory for a bit? 
I mean, if it works well to alleviate the pressure in the queue, then I'd say leave it on. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm not really that concerned about having an ephemeral cluster that doesn't look exactly like a proper Kubernetes cluster, because we already know that CI doesn't look like that. Otherwise, etcd would run fine. Um, the fact that it doesn't means we don't have a super representative environment. So, I mean, yeah. Anyway, I do have to respect the boundaries of the time of this call and end it. So I'm going to do that. Um, and I guess we can carry the discussion into the PR. Yep, that's fair. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining. And we'll see you at the next SIG storage in two weeks. Have a good day. See you.